I'm back. Hello. Joining me for the next part in this job schedule series, and this is the fun part. I'm I'm not kidding about that. Well, maybe I'm the only one that thinks it's fun because I'm kind of a nerd and a geek, but this is the part that I really enjoy, which is really looking at what does this job schedule mean? So if you followed along on the other two, we learned what information you needed to gather up, and we learned what the different columns mean. You can follow along with that one. And then we learned how to affect our financial statements with the journal entry and therefore balance and match our revenue to our cost. In this piece, I want to talk about what the results of this really show. And I'm going to show you a couple other columns that I like to look at. And I think that they might be useful to you. And so I didn't want to not talk about this. The first one I like to look at is the, and we're going to actually use all the calculated columns for this video. So I want to look at gross profit and gross profit percentage. So why do I look at it? What I want to look at this, these columns for is I'm looking for a couple of key pieces. What I want to look at is that we've got a group of jobs here that are all running about 14% in gross average gross margin. So let's use some critical thinking skills here and say, what should our income statement gross margin run? Well, 14%, right? I mean, that's the way it should work, but it doesn't always work that way. And so I use this portion of the job schedule to test whether my income statement makes any sense. And in order to do that, I'm first looking and saying, okay, well, overall, we're earning 14%. So if I go to my job schedule and I see, I'm sorry, if I go to my income statement and I show we're earning 20%, I'm going to ask a few more questions like what causes that? Are there jobs that aren't on my schedule that are doing very well? Like let's say a group of service jobs. Um, is there something I missed? Is there something misposted? But I really should see something that is similar to the results of my jobs on my job schedule to what the results in my financial statements for the same piece of work. What if I see the other thing? What if I see that we go to our income statement and our gross margin is running something like 5%? Uh, yeah, that's not normal either. That means that, again, I could have missed something on the job schedule. Maybe something got posted as a cost after I prepared my schedule and ran my journal entries. But I use this column to go and test and analyze whether my income statement makes sense before I ever let it leave my, my possession. So what do you do if it doesn't make sense? Well, of course, I want to run through and make sure that I did grab the right costs to date. I did grab the right billings to date. I did make sure that my cost in excess and billings in excess tie. And then if it's still off, I might have to dig in even deeper. And that would be for another video. But the first things you want to test is make sure that you have all the information proper on your job schedule. So now that we've looked at our gross profit and our income statement, and let's just say that your income statement is running 13%, and I would go, you know, that's probably pretty close, so you can move on. So what else do I learn out of this schedule? Well, Here's the parts I get excited about. Let's look at the cost in excess and billings in excess. We are asked a lot, is like one good and one bad? And what does it mean? Well, it depends on what you're looking for. Now, I like to focus on cash because I think cash is so important. It's the, what is the cash is king? Cash is lifeblood of the business. You know, all those fancy cash raises. Well, looking at our particular job schedule, what this means, if we take a snapshot as of 6.30, that means that we are going to be short of cash. And how do I know that? Well, we're underbilled. So that means that at some point, this 120 versus the $90,000 is going to rear its head in cash. And I can expect that I am going to be short about $30,000 in my cash flow, because this is our example, in usually sometime between 30 and 90 days. Now, why do I have such a wide range here? It depends on whether you're a general or you're a sub, and it depends on the terms of your payment with your customers and your vendors and suppliers. 
and subcontractors. So depending on what your ratio is and what you run, because uh, if you're a general, you're going to run collections faster than if you're a sub. Many subs are running, you know, a 55 to 60 day collection period. If you're a third tier sub, it could be even longer. And then depending on when you pay your subs, vendors, suppliers will determine when this happens, if it happens in 30 days or if it happens in 90 days. But it means that at some point, you're going to be upside down in cash. So whenever I see something in this column, whenever my cost in excess is larger than my billings in excess, I pause for a minute and I start recognizing, am I going to need to draw in a line? Do I need to prioritize some upcoming payments? What do I need to do to make sure that this doesn't turn around and bite me whenever I'm trying to manage the cash piece? Now, billings in excess, you know, I'm kind of a fan because that means that there is going to be a time whenever I am having cash. So if I had to pick, I would pick over billings higher than under billings. Now, what about your outside people? What does your bank and your bonding company think? Well, they kind of feel the same as me. They like to see over billings more than under billings, but they don't like to see very big ranges of either. If there is a mm, red flag, the red flag comes from this one. If you have cost and excess of billings and you have continuous cost of excess and billings on a job, Many times that can be an indicator that the job is actually going to perform at a loss or at least lower than what you have it on the job schedule for. Now, this is not always exact. It could just be that you're not able to front bill or project bill three weeks of payroll, so it's always underbilled. It could relate to the timing of the job. But if you are running a pretty standard underbilling amount on a job and it does not fall into that kind of a category, you really need to ask some questions on whether these columns are correct. So if I see steady cost and excess of billings on an outsider, it brings a red flag of maybe there's a loss. For me, it's a red flag because I know it's going to affect cash. And now we're going to go to my other two favorite columns, which are these back two columns. Now, I call these columns optional. They're not on every job schedule. They, they don't perform any function other than its information. So why do I like these two? Well, I just get to see revenue backlog. And whenever I'm dealing with the accounting and the finance function, I want to know what is coming. So I know that we have $2.5 million still yet to earn for our revenue. And I also know that we're going to earn $394,000 in gross margin. Now, if I know my overhead, I can also kind of start looking at, are we going to be profitable? Are we going to have net income just based on these two columns? It takes a little bit to get your rhythm on these last two columns, but I like to include them because now I can also contribute as we're talking about revenue and backlog and gross margin and overhead and cost recovery. It's like my little secret weapon to know how we're doing. So I promised in one of my first ones that I would also deal with what would happen if you have trouble getting this information. So this is kind of my last little tip and why I enjoy this schedule and this process so much. Sometimes the first time you're going to ask about these information from your project manager and estimator they may not be comfortable answering or they may get discouraged or uh you know they just don't understand why well you can let them watch these videos that might help and might save you a little bit of pain but what if you can't get the information so i give you my first be best tip beg yeah beg them please 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 will you please give me the information um, they probably will laugh, but sometimes they might pity you and help you out, which, you know, I don't care how I get it as, as long as I get it. So many times I will beg, please, 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 will you help me? You, you, you're killing me, Smalls. You've got to help me on this. And many times my begging actually works. Um, you know, I don't know if you're going to need to pull out the waterworks, but I, my, my, my begging usually does get me there. If they're not available or they just refuse, 
then the next place to go is see if you can find a job, well, see if you can find the original estimate. Sometimes that is available to you so you could use that information. Again, it's not the best because we want the future think. We wanna know how that job's ultimately gonna turn out and not really how the job was only estimated. We wanna know if we uh, bought it out differently or we're gonna have labor overruns. And the next one is if you could use a similar job if you've really got nothing you could use a similar job or past performance and put a number in those columns so you might go in and and sometimes you won't have any of this information so let's just i'm, I'm going to totally mess up my schedule here but hang it hang with me because i think you'll understand why i'm doing it what i would then do is say okay i don't know any of this information so i'm just going to use the current cost that we have to date and I don't know what our contract amount is going to be, but you know, we typically make 14%. So I'm going to just mark my cost up 14% and get a number in there. Now, do you remember? You might remember this number was 58,805 or 818. I don't know. Uh, 58,000, I remember that part. So look at what we just did. We got close to our over billings amount by just using an average. Again, this isn't the perfect world, but if you're stuck and you don't know what to do to move forward, you always can just, well, guess. And you would be better off in guessing than to leave this job making $65,000 in gross profit. I think you see where I'm going. And the last item is if some, sometimes you'll have your PMs or estimators struggle just because you're asking for it on a monthly basis. So the next key piece on this is to beg them on a quarterly basis instead. So you could go in and please, 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 please on your quarter ends and then use that information for the other two months. Again, it's not perfect. It's not the best, but sometimes it's the only thing you've got. And many times if you say, I only need you to do it four times a year to really dig deep and really give me a full analysis of the job and where you think it's gonna end up, they'll go, okay, okay, I will do that. Um, you know, a lot of the project managers already know how that job is going to turn up. And so this isn't any big deal for them. They're happy to share it. But every once in a while, you're gonna have to ask in different ways to be able to complete this. So I hope you've enjoyed this series and understanding more about the job schedule. We've gone through what you need to gather, where to gather it, how to book the journal entry, and then the key pieces that you also learn from this and how it relates to cash flow. And then I even threw in the begging, which I, ho I hope you really enjoyed. So I hope this gave you the information that you needed. If for some reason you need additional help, you know to email us at the info at atlascfo.com. And by all means, don't be afraid to allow your project managers and estimators to also view these videos. It might really help the relationship and understanding the importance of the job. I hope you have a great day and that this job schedule series has made a difference for you. Thanks.